No Cowherders Wanted by Robert Howard. I hear a gang of buffalo hunters got together recently in a saloon in Dodge City to discuss ways and means of keeping their sculps onto their heads whilst collecting pelts. And pretty soon one of them riz and said, You mavericks make me sick. For the last hour you've been chawing wind about the soldiers trying to keep us north of the Cimarron and belly aching about the Comanches, Kiowas, and Apaches, which yearns for our hair. You've took up all that time jawing about such trifling hazards and planning steps to take again em, but you ain't making no efforts whatsoever to protect yourselves again the biggest menace they is to the entire buffalo hunting clan, which is Breckenridge Elkins. That just shows how easy prejudiced folks is. You'd think I had a grudge agin buffalo hunters, the way they takes to the bresh whenever they sees me coming, and the way they misrepresents what happened at Cordova is plumb disgustful. To hear em talk, you'd think I was the only man there which committed any violence. If that's so, I'd like to know how all them bullet holes got in the Diamond Bar Saloon which I was using for a fort. Who throwed the mayor through that board fence? Who sought fire to Joe Emerson's store just to smoke me out? Who started the row in the first place by sticking up insulting signs in public places? They ain't no use in them fellers trying to act innocent. Any unbiased man which was there, and survived to tell the tale, knows I acted all the way through with as much dignity as a man can act, which is being shot at by forty or fifty wild-eyed buffalo skinners. I had never even saw a buffalo hunter before, because it was the first time I'd ever been that far east. I was taking a passear into New Mexico with a cowpoke by the name of Glaze Bannock, which I'd met in Arizona. I stopped in Albuquerque, and he went on, heading for Dodge City. Well, I weren't in Albuquerque as long as I'd aimed to be, account of going broke quicker than I expected. I had just one dollar left after paying for having three fellers sewed up, which had somehow got a foul of my bowie knife after criticizing the Democratic Party. I ain't the man to leave my opponents on the public charge. Well, I pulled out of town and headed for the cow camps on the Pecos, aiming to get me a job. But I hadn't went far till I met a waddy riding in, and he taken a good look at me and Captain Kidd and says, You must be him. Wouldn't no other man fit the description he give me. Who, I says? Glaze Bannock, says he. He give me a letter to give to Breckenridge Elkins. So I says, Well, all right, give me it. So he did, and it read as follows. Dear Breckenridge, I am in jail in Panther Springs for nothing. All I done was kind of push the deputy sheriff with a little piece of scrap iron. Could I help it if he fell down and fractured his skull, Breckenridge? But they say I got to pay ten dollars fine, and I have not got no such money, Breckenridge. But old man Garnett over on Buck Creek owes me ten bucks, so you collect from him and come and pay me out of this hen coop. The food is terrible, Breckenridge. Hustle. Your misjudged friend, Glaze Bannock, Esquire. Glaze never could stay out of trouble, not being tactful like me, but he was a pretty good sort of hombre. So I headed for Buck Creek and collected the money off of old man Garnett, which was somewhat reluctant to give up the dough. In fact, he bit me severely in the hind leg whilst I was settin' on him, prying his fingers loose from that there tin spot. And when I rode off down the road with a dinero, 
he run into his shack and got his buffalo gun and shot at me till I was clean out of sight. But I ignored his lack of hospitality. I knowed he was too dizzy to shoot straight, account of him having accidentally banged his head on a fence post, which I happened to have in my hand whilst we was wrestling. I left him waving his gun and howling damnation and destruction, and I was well on the road for Panther Springs before I discovered, to my disgust, that my shirt was a complete ruin. I considered going back and demanding that old man Garnett buy me a new one, account of his being the one which tore it. But he was such a unreasonable old cuss, I decided again it, and rode on to Panther Springs, arriving there shortly after noon. The first critter I seen was the purtiest gal I'd saw in a coon's age. She come out of a store and stopped to talk to a young cowpuncher she called Curly. I rein Captain Kidd around behind a corn crib so she wouldn't see me in my scarecrow condition. After a while she went on down the street and went into a cabin with a fence around it and a front porch, which showed her folks was wealthy. And I come out from behind the crib and says to the young buck which was smirking after her and combing his hair with the other hand, I says, Who is that there gal, the one you was just talking to? Judith Granger, says he. Her folks lives over to Sheba, but her old man brung her over here on account of all the fellers over there was about to cut each other's throats over her. He's making her stay a spell with her Aunt Henrietta, which is a war hoss if I ever seen one. The boys is so scared of her, they don't dast try to spark Judith. Except me. I persuaded the old mud hen to let me call on Judith, and I'm going over there for supper. That's what you think. I says gently. Fact is, though, Miss Granger has got a date with me. She didn't tell me, he begun scowling. She don't know it herself, yet, I says. But I'll tell her you was sorry you couldn't show up. Why, you, he says, bloodthirsty, and started for his gun, when a feller who'd been watching us from the store door hollered, By golly! If it ain't Breckenridge Elkins. Breckenridge Elkins, gasped Curly, and he dropped his gun and keeled over with a low gurgle. Has he got a weak heart? I asked the feller, which had recognized me. And he said, Aw, oh, he just fainted when he realized how close he'd come to throwing a gun on the terror of the Humboldts. Drag him over to the hoss trough, boys, and throw some water on him. Breckenridge, I owns that grocery store there, and your pa knows me right well. As a special favor to me, will you refrain from killing anybody in my store? So I said all right. Then I remembered my shirt was tore too bad to call on a young lady in. I generally has em made to order, but they weren't time for that if I was going to eat supper with Miss Judith. So I went into the general store and bought me one. I don't know why they don't make shirts big enough to fit reasonable-sized men like me. You'd think nobody but midgets wore shirts. The biggest one in the store weren't only eighteen in the collar, but I didn't figure on buttoning the collar anyway. If I'd tried to button it, it would have strangled me. So I give the feller five dollars and put it on. It fit pretty close but I believed I could wear it if I didn't have to expand my chest or something. Of course, I had to use some of Glaze's dough to pay for it with, but I didn't reckon he'd mind, considering all the trouble I was going to, to get him out of jail. I rode down the alley behind the jail and come to a barred window and said, Hey, Glaze looked out, kind of peaked, like his grub weren't setting well with him, but he brightened up and says, Hooray! I've been on edge expecting you. Go on round to the front door, Breck, and pay them coyotes the tin spot and let's go. The grub I've been getting here would turn a lobo's stomach. 
Well, I says, I ain't exactly got the ten bucks glaze. I had to have a shirt because mine got tore, so he gave a yelp like a stricken elk and grabbed the bars convulsively. Are you crazy? he hollered. You squanders my money on linens and fine raiment whilst I languishes in a prison dungeon? Be calm, I advised. I still got five bucks a yarn and one of mine. All I got to do is step down to a gambling hall and build it up. Build it up, says he fiercely. Listen, blast your hide. Does you know what I've had for breakfast, dinner, and supper ever since I was throwed in here? Beans, beans, beans. Here he was so overcome by emotion that he choked on the word. "'And they ain't even first-class beans, neither,' he said bitterly, when he could talk again. "'They're full of grit and wormholes, and I think the Mex cook washes his feet in the pot he cooks em in.' "'Well,' I says, "'such cleanliness is to be encouraged, "'cause I never heard of one before which washed his feet in anything. "'Don't worry. I'll get in a poker game and win enough to pay your fine and plenty over.' Well, get at it, he begged. Get me out before supper time. I wants a steak with onions so bad I can smell it. So I headed for the Golden Steer Saloon. They weren't many men in there just then, but they was a poker game going on, and when I told them I craved to set in, they looked me over and made room for me. They was a black-whiskered cuss which said he was from Cordova, which was dealing, and the first thing I noticed was he was dealing his own hand off the bottom of the deck. The others didn't seem to see it, but, but us Bear Creek folks has got eyes like hawks, otherwise we'd never live to get grown. So I says, I don't know what the rules is in these parts. But where I come from, we almost always deals off the top of the deck. Air you accusing me of cheating? he demands passionately, fumbling for his weapons, and in his agitation, dropping three or four extra aces out of his sleeves. I wouldn't think of such a thing, I says. Probably them marked yards I see sticking out of your boot tops is merely souvenirs. For some reason this seemed to infuriate him to the point of drawing a bowie knife. So I hit him over the head with a brass cuspidor, and he fell under the table with a holler groan. Some of the fellers run in and looked at his boots sticking out from under the table, and one of them said, Hey, I'm the justice of the peace. You can't do that. This is an orderly town. And another one said, I'm the sheriff. If you can't keep the peace, I'll have to arrest you. This was too much, even for a mild-mannered man like me. Shit your fool heads, I roared, brandishing my fists. I come here to pay Glaze Bannock's fine and get him out of jail, peaceable and orderly, and I'm trying to raise the dough like a deleted gentleman. But by golly, if you hyenas pushes me beyond endurance, I'll tear down the cussed jail and snake him out without paying no blasted fine. The justice of the peace turned white. He says to the sheriff, Let him alone. I've already bought these here new boots on credit on the strength of them ten bucks we gets from Bannock. But, says the sheriff dubiously, and the J.P. hissed fiercely, Shut up, you blame fool. I just now recognized him. That's Breckenridge Elkins. The sheriff turned pale and swallowed his Adam's apple and says feebly, Excuse me, I, uh, I ain't feeling so good. I guess it's something I et. I think I'd better ride over to the next county and get me some pills. But I don't think he was very sick from the way he run after he got outside the saloon. If they'd been a jackrabbit ahead of him, he would have trompled the gizzard out of it. Well, they'd taken the black-whiskered gent out from under the table and started pouring water on him, and I seen it was now about supper time, 
so I went over to the cabin where Judith lived. I was met at the door by an iron-jawed female, about the size of an ordinary barn, which give me a suspicious look and says, "'Well, what you want?' "'I'm looking for your sister, Miss Judith,' I says, taking off my Stetson politely. "'What you mean, my sister?' says she with a scowl, but a much milder tone. "'I'm her aunt.' "'You don't mean to tell me,' I said, looking plumb astonished. "'Why, when I first seen you, I thought you was her herself.' and couldn't figure out how nobody but a twin sister could have such a resemblance. Well, I can see right off that youth and beauty is a family characteristic. Go along with you, you young scoundrel, says she, smirking and giving me a nudge with her elbow, which would have busted anybody's ribs but mine. You can't soft-soap me. Come in. I'll call Judith. What's your name? Breckenridge Elkins, ma'am, I says. So, says she, looking at me with new interest, I've heard tell of you, but you got a lot more sense than they give you credit for. Oh, Judith, she called, and the winders rattled when she let her voice go. You got company. Judith come in looking prettier than ever and when she seen me, she batted her eyes and recoiled violently. Who, who's that? she demanded wildly. Mr. Breckenridge Elkins of Bear Creek, Nevada, says her aunt, the only young man I've met in this whole dern town which has got any sense. Well, come on in and set. Supper's on the table. We was just waiting for Curly Jacobs, she says to me, but if the varmint can't get here on time, he can go hungry. He can't come, I says. He sent word by me he's sorry. Well, I ain't, snorted Judith Sant. I give him permission to just because I figured even a bodacious flirt like Judith wouldn't cotton to such a sapsucker. But Aunt Henrietta, protested Judith, blushing, I can't abide the sight of such weaklings, says Aunt Henrietta, settling herself carefully into a rawhide bottom chair which groaned under her weight. Drag up that bench, Breckenridge. It's the only thing in the house which has a chance of holding your weight outside the sofa in the front room. Don't argue with me, Judith. I says Curly Jacobs ain't no fit man for a gal like you. Didn't I see him strain his fool back, trying to lift that there barrel of salt I wanted fotched to the smokehouse? I finally had to tote it myself. What makes young men so blame spindling these days? Pat blames the Republican Party, I says. Ha, 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 says she in a guffaw, which shook the doors on their hinges and scared the cat into convulsions. "'Young man, you got a great sense of humor, ain't he, Judith?' says she, cracking a beef bone betwixt her teeth like it was a pecan. Judith says, yes, kind of pallid, and all during the meal she eyed me kind of nervous like she was expecting me to go into a war dance or something. Well, when we was through and Aunt Henrietta had had enough to keep a tribe of Sioux through a hard winter, she riz up and says, Now clear out of here whilst I washes the dishes. But I must help with them, says Judith. And Henrietta snorted. What makes you so eager to work all of a sudden? You want your guest to think you ain't eager for his company? Get out of here. So she went, but I paused to say kind of doubtful to Aunt Henrietta. I ain't sure Judith likes me much. Don't pay no attention to her whims, says Aunt Henrietta, picking up the water barrel to fill her dishpan. She's a flirtatious minx. I've took a liking to you, and if I decide you're the right man for her, you're as good as hitched. Nobody couldn't never do nothing with her but me, but she's learned who her boss is, after having to eat her meals off the mantel board a few times. Go on in, quarter. Don't be backward. So I went on in the front room, and Judith seemed to kind of warm up to me and asked me a lot of questions about Nevada, 
and finally she says she's heard me spoke of as a fighting man and hoped i ain't had no trouble in panther springs i told her no only i had to hit one black-whiskered thug from cordova over the head with a cuspidor at that she jumped up like she'd sought on a pin that was my uncle jabez granger she hollered how dast you you big bully you ought to be ashamed of great big man like you picking on a little feller like him which don't weigh a ounce over two hundred and fifteen pounds aw shucks i said contritely i'm sorry judith just as i was beginning to like you she mourned now he'll write to pap and prejudice him agin you you just gotta go and find him and apologize to him and make friends with him aw heck i said but she wouldn't listen to nothing else so i went out and clumb on the cap'n kid went back to the golden steer and when i come in everybody crawled under the tables what's the matter with you all i said fretfully i'm looking for jabez granger he's left for cordova says the barkeeper sticking his head up from behind the bar well there weren't nothing to do but follow him so i rode by the jail and glaze was at the window and he says eagerly are you ready to pay me out be patient glaze i says i ain't got the dough yet but i'll get it somehow as soon as i get back from cordova what he shrieked be calm like me i advised you don't see me getting all head up do you i gotta go catch judith granger's uncle jabez and apologize to the old illegitimate for busting his conk with a spittoon i'd be back tomorrow or the next day at the most well his language was scandalous considering all the trouble i was going to just to get him out of jail but i refused to take offence i headed back to the granger cabin and judith was on the front porch i didn't see aunt henrietta she was back in the kitchen washing dishes and singing they've laid jesse james in his grave in a voice which loosened the shingles on the roof so i told judith where i was going and asked her to take some pies and cakes and things to the jail for glaze account of the beans was ruin in his stomach and she said she would so i pulled stakes for cordova it laid quite a ways to the east and i figured to catch up with uncle jabez before he got there but he had a long start and was on a mighty good hoss i reckon anyway cap'n kidd got one of his hell-fire streaks and insisted on stopping every few miles to buck all over the landscape till i finally got sick of his mulishness and busted him over the head with my pistol by this time we'd lost so much time I never overtaken Uncle Jabez at all, and it was getting daylight before I come in sight of Cordova. Well, about sun up, I come on to a old feller and his wife in a ramshackle wagon, drawed by a couple of skinny mules with a hound dog. One wheel had run off into a sinkhole, and the mules were so poor and good for nothing they couldn't pull it out. So I got off and laid hold onto the wagon and the old man said wait a minute young feller whilst me and the old lady gets out to lighten the load what for i asked set still so i hoisted the wheel out but if it'd been stuck any tighter i might have had to use both hands by golly says the old man i'd a swore nobody but breckenridge elkins could do that well i'm him i says and they both looked at me with reverence and i asked em was they going to panther springs we aim to says the old woman kind of hopeless one place is as good as another to old people which has been robbed out of their life savings you all been robbed i asked shocked well says the old man i ain't in the habit of burdening strangers with my woes but as a matter of fact we has my name's hopkins i had a ranch down on the pecos till the drouth wiped me out 
and we moved to Panther Springs with what little we saved from the wreck. In a ill-advised moment, I started speculating on buffler hides. I put in all my cash, buying a load over on the Llano Estacado, which I aimed to freight to Santa Fe, and sell at a fat profit. I happen to know they're fetching a higher price there now than the air in Dodge City. And last night the whole blame cargo disappeared into thin air, as it were. We was stopping at Cordova for the night and the old lady was sleeping in the hotel, and I was camped at the edge of town with the wagon. During the night somebody snuck up and hit me over the head. When I come to this morning, hides, wagon, and team was all gone, and no trace. When I told the city marshal, he just laughed in my face and asked me how I'd expect him to track down a load of buffalo hides in a town that was full of them. Dang him, they was packed and corded neat with my old brand, the Circle A, marked on em in red paint. Joe Emerson, which owns the saloon and most all the town, taken a mortgage on our little shack in Panther Springs, and loaned me enough money to buy this measly team and wagon. If we can get back to Panther Springs, maybe I can get enough freightin' to do so we can kind of live anyway. Well, I said, much moved by the story. I'm going to Cordova, and I'll see if I can't find your hides. Thank ye kindly, Breckenridge, says he. But I got a idee them hides is already far on their way to Dodge City. Well, I hopes you has better luck in Cordova than we did. So they drove on west, and I rode east and got to Cordova about an hour after sun-up. As I come into the age of town, I seen a signboard about the size of a door stuck up which says on it, in big letters, No cowherders allowed in Cordova. What the hell does that mean? I demanded wrathfully of a feller which had stopped by it to light him a cigarette. And he says, Just what it says. Cordova's full of buffler hunters in for a spree, and they don't like cowboys. Big as you be, I'd advise you to light a shuck for somewheres else. Bull Krogan put that sign up, and you ought to see what happened to the last puncher which ignored it. Expletive deleted, I says in a voice which shook the beans out of the mesquite trees for miles around. And so saying, I pulled up the sign and headed for Main Street with it in my hand. I am as peaceful and mild-mannered a critter as you could hope to meet, but even with me a man can go too damn far. This here's a free country, and no derned hairy-necked buffalo skinner can draw boundary lines for us cowpunchers and get away with it. Not whilst I can pull a trigger. They was very few people on the street, and such as was looked at me surprised like. Where the hell is them fool buffalo hunters? I roared. And a feller says, They're all gone to the race track east of town to race hosses, except Bull Crogan, which has taken his self a dram in the diamond bar. So I lit and stalked into the diamond bar with my spurs a jingling and my disposition getting thornier every second. They was a big hairy critter in buckskins and moccasins standing at the bar drinking whiskey and talking to the barkeep, and a flashy dressed gent with slick hair and a diamond horseshoe stick pin. They all turned and gaped at me, and the hunter wretched for his belt where he was wearing the longest knife I ever seen. Who air you? he gasped. A cowman, I roared, brandishing the sign. Are you Bull Krogan? Yeah, says he. What about it? So I busted the signboard over his head, and he fell onto the floor yelling bloody murder and trying to draw his knife. The board was splintered, but the stake it had been fastened to was a pretty good-sized post, so I took and beat him over the head with it till the bartender tried to shoot me with a sawed-off shotgun. 
I grabbed the barrel, and the charge just busted a shelf load of whiskey bottles, and I throwed the shotgun through a nearby window. As I neglected to get the bartender loose from it first, it appears he went along with it. Anyway, he picked himself up off the ground, bleeding freely, and heading east down the street, shrieking, Help! Murder! A cowboy is killing Krogan and Emerson! Which was a lie, because Krogan had crawled out the front door on his all fours whilst I was tending to the barkeep, and if Emerson had showed any judgment he wouldn't have got his skull laid open to the bone. How did I know he was just trying to hide behind the bar? I thought he was going for a gun he had hid back there. As soon as I realized the truth, I dropped what was left of the bung starter and commenced pouring water on Emerson, and pretty soon he sot up and looked round wild-eyed, with blood and water dripping off his head. "'What happened?' he gurgled. "'Nothing to get excited about,' I assured him, knocking the neck off a bottle of whiskey. "'I'm looking for a gent named Jabez Granger.' It was at this moment that the city marshal opened fire on me through the back door. He grazed my neck with his first slug, and would probably have hit me with the next if I hadn't shot the gun out of his hand. He then run off down the alley. I pursued him and catched him when he looked back over his shoulder and hit a garbage can. "'I'm an officer of the law!' he howled, trying to get his neck out from under my foot so as he could draw his buoy. Don't you dast assault no officer of the law. I ain't, I snarled, kicking the knife out of his hand and kind of casually wiping my spur across his whiskers. But a officer which lets an old man get robbed of his buffalo hides then laughs in his face ain't deserving to be no officer. Give me that badge. I demotes you to a private citizen. I then hung him on to a nearby hen roost by the seat of his breeches and went back up the alley, ignoring his impassioned profanity. I didn't go in at the back door of the saloon because I figured Joe Emerson might be laying to shoot me as I came in. So I went around the saloon to the front and run smack onto a mob of buffalo hunters which had evidently been summoned from the racetrack by the barkeep. They had Bull Krogan at the hoss trough and was trying to wash the blood off of him, and they was all yelling and cussing so loud they didn't see me at first. Here we to be defied in our own lair by a deleted cow shepherd, howled Krogan. Scatter and comb the town for him. He's hiding down some back alley, like as not. We'll hang him in front of the diamond bar and stick his scalp onto a pole as a warning to all his breed. Just let me lay eyes onto him again. Well, all you got to do is turn around, I says. And they all whirled so quick they dropped Krogan into the hoss trough. They gaped at me with their mouths open for a second. Krogan riz out of the water, snorting and spluttering and yelling, Well, what are you waiting on? Grab him! It was in trying to obey his instructions that three of them got their skulls fractured, and whilst the others was stumbling and falling over them, I backed into the saloon and pulled my six-shooters and issued a defiance to the world at large, and buffalo hunters in particular. They run for cover behind hitch racks and troughs and porches and fences, and a feller in a plug hat came out and says, "'Gentlemen!' Let's don't have no bloodshed within the city limits. As mayor of this fair city, I... It was at this instant that Krogan picked him up and throwed him through a board fence into a cabbage patch, where he lay till somebody revived him a few hours later. The hunters then all started shooting at me with fifty caliber Sharps buffalo rifles. Emerson, which was hiding behind a Schlitz signboard, hollered something amazing account of the holes which was being knocked into the roof and walls. The big sign in front was shot to splinters, and the mirror behind the bar was riddled, and all the bottles on the shelves and the hanging lamps was busted. It's plumb astonishing the damage a bushel or so of them big slugs can do to a saloon. 
They went right through the walls. If I hadn't kept moving all the time, I'd have been shot to rags. And I did get several bullets through my clothes, and three or four grazed some hide off. But even so, I had the edge, because they couldn't see me only for glimpses now and then through the winders, and was shooting more or less blind, because I had them all spotted and slung lead so fast and close they didn't dast show theirselves long enough to take good aim. But my cartridges began to run short, so I made a sally out into the alley just as one of them was trying to sneak in the back door. I hear tell he's very bitter toward me about his teeth, but I like to know how he expects to get kicked in the mouth without losing some fangs. So I jumped over his writhing carcass and run down the alley, winging three or four as I went, and collecting a pistol ball in my hind leg. They was hiding behind board fences on each side of the alley, but them boards wouldn't stop a forty-five slug. They all shot at me, but they misjudged my speed. I move a lot faster than most folks expect. Anyway, I was out of the alley before they could get their wits back, and as I went past the hitch rack where Captain Kidd was champing and snorting to get into the fight, I grabbed my Winchester forty-five ninety off of the saddle and run across the street. The hunters, which was still shooting at the front of the diamond bar, seen me, and that's when I got my spurs shot off. But I ducked into Emerson's general store, whilst the clerks all run shrieking out the back way. As for that misguided hunter, which tried to confiscate Captain Kidd, I ain't to blame for what happened to him. They're going around now saying I trained Captain Kidd special to jump onto a buffalo hunter with all four feet after kicking him through a corral fence. That's a lie. I didn't have to train him. He thought of it himself. The idiot which tried to take him ought to be thankful he was able to walk with crutches inside of ten months. Well, I was now on the same side of the street as the hunters was, so as soon as I started shooting at em from the store winders, they run across the street and taken refuge in a dance hall right across from the store and started shooting back at me. And Joe Emerson hollered louder than ever, because he owned the dance hall too. All the citizens of the town had bolted into the hills long ago and left us to fight it out. Well, I piled sides of pork and barrels of pickles and bolts of calico in the winders and shot over them, and I built my barricades so solid even them buffalo guns couldn't shoot through them. They was plenty of Colt and Winchester ammunition in the store, and whiskey, so I knowed I could hold the fort indefinite. Them hunters could tell they weren't doing no damage, so pretty soon I heard Krogan bellerin, Go get that cannon the soldiers loaned the folks to fight the Apaches with. It's over behind the city hall. Bring it in at the back door. We'll blast him out of his fort, by golly. You'll ruin my store, screamed Emerson. I'll ruin your face if you don't shut up, opined Krogan. Go on. Well, they kept shooting, and so did I, and I must have hit some of them, judging from the blood-curdling yells that went up from time to time. Then a most remarkable racket of cussin' busted out, and from the remarks passed, I gathered they'd brung the cannon and somehow got it stuck in the back door of the dance hall. The shootin' kind of died down while they wrestled with it, and in the lull I heard me a noise out behind the store. They weren't no winders in the back, which is why they hadn't shot at me from that direction. I snuck back and looked through a crack in the door, and I seen a feller in the dry gully which run along behind the store and he had a kerosene can and some matches and was setting the store on fire. I just started to shoot when I recognized Judith Granger's Uncle Jabez. I laid down my Winchester and opened the door soft and easy and pounced out on him. But he let out a squawk and dodged and run down the gully. The shooting across the street broke out again, 
but I give no heed because I weren't going to let him get away from me again. I run him down the gully about a hundred yards and catched him, and taken his pistol away from him, but he got hold of a rock which he hammered me on the head with till I nigh lost patience with him. But I didn't want to injure him on account of Judith, so I merely kicked him in the belly, then throwed him before he could get his breath back, and sawed on him, and says, Blast your hide, I apologizes for lambing you with that there cuspidor. Does you accept my apology, you pot-bellied hoss-thief? Never, says he, rampacious, a granger never forgets. So I taken him by the ears and beat his head again a rock till he gasps, Let up! I accept your apology, you deleted expletive. All right, I says, arising and dusting my hands. And if you ever goes back on your word, I'll hang your mangy hide to the... It was at that moment that Emerson's general store blew up with a ear-splitting bang. What the hell? shrieked Uncle Jabez, staggering, as the air was filled with fragments of groceries and pieces of flying timber. Ah, oh, I said disgustedly, I reckon a stray bullet hit a barrel of gunpowder. I aimed to move them barrels out of the line of fire, but kind of forgot about it. But Uncle Jabez had bit the dust. I hear tell he claims I hit him unexpected with a wagon pole. I didn't do no such thing. It was a section of the porch roof which fell on him, and if he'd been watching and ducked like I did, it wouldn't a hit him. I clumb out of the gully and found myself opposite from the diamond bar. Bull Krogan and the hunters was pouring out of the dance hall whooping and yelling, and Joe Emerson was tearing his hair and howling like a timber wolf with a belly ache because his store was blowed up and his saloon was shot all to pieces. But nobody paid no attention to him. They went surging across the street, and nobody seen me when I crossed it from the other side and went into the alley that run behind the saloon. I run on down it till I got to the dance hall, and sure enough the cannon was stuck in the back door. It weren't wide enough for the wheels to get through. I heard Krogan roaring across the street. Poke into the debray, boys. Elkins' remains must be in here somewheres unless he was plumb dissolved. That crash! They was a splinter and a planks, and somebody yelled, Hey, Krogan's fell into a well or something. I heard Joe Emerson shriek, Damn it, stay away from there! Don't! I tore away a section of the wall and got the cannon loose and run it up to the front door of the dance hall and looked out. Them hunters was all ganged up with their backs to the dance hall, all bent over, whilst they was apparently trying to pull Krogan out of some hole he fell into head first. His cussin' sounded kind of muffled. Joe Emerson was having a fit at the edge of the crowd. Well, they'd loaded that there cannon with nails and spikes and lead slugs and carpet tacks and such lack, but I put in a double handful of beer bottle caps just for good measure and touched her off. It made a noise like a thunderclap, and the recoil knocked me about seventeen foot, but you should a heard the yell them hunters let out when that hurricane of scrap iron hit em in the seat of the breeches. It was amazing. To my disgust, though, it didn't kill none of em. Seems like the charge was too heavy for the powder, so all it done was knock em off their feet and tear the breeches off of em. However, it swept the ground clean of em like a broom, and left em all standing on their necks in the gully behind where the store had been, except Krogan, whose feet I still perceived sticking up out of the ruins. Before they could recover their wits, if they ever had any, I run across the street and started beating them over the head with a pillar I tore off the saloon porch. Some, such as was able, ariz and fled howling into the desert. I hear tell some of em didn't stop till they got to Dodge City, havin' run right through a Kiowa war party 
that scared them poor injuns till they turned white. Well, I laid hold to Krogan's legs and pulled him out of the place he had fell into, which seemed to be a kind of cellar, which had been under the floor of the store. Krogan's conversation didn't no ways make sense, and every time I let go of him he fell on his neck. So I abandoned him in disgust, and looked down into the cellar to see what was in it that Emerson should have took so much to keep it hid. Well, it was plumb full of buffalo hides, all corded into neat bundles. At that, Emerson started to run, but I grabbed him and reached down with the other hand and hauled a bundle out. It was marked with a red Circle A brand. So, I says to Emerson, impulsively busting him in the snout, you stole old man Hopkins hide yourself. Produce that mortgage. Where's that old man's wagon and team? I got em hid in my livery stable, he moaned. Go hitch em up and bring em here, I says, and if you tries to run off, I'll track you down and sculp you alive. I went and got Captain Kidd and watered him. When I got back, Emerson come up with the wagon and team, so I told him to load on them hides. I'm a ruined man, sniveled he. I ain't able to load no hides. The exercise'll do you good, I assured him, kicking the seat loose from his pants, so he gave the harass howl and went to work. About this time Krogan sat up and gaped at me weirdly. It all comes back to me, he gurgled. We was going to run Breckenridge Elkins out of town. He then fell back and went into shrieks of hysterical laughter, which was most hair-raising to hear. The wagon's loaded, panted Joe Emerson. Take it and get out and be quick. Well, let this be a lesson to you, I says, ignoring his hostile attitude. Honesty's always the best policy. I then hit him over the head with a wagon spoke and clucked to the hosses, and we headed for Panther Springs. Old man Hopkins' mules had give out halfway to Panther Springs. Him and the old lady was camped there when I drove up. I never seen folks so happy in my life as they was when I handed the team, wagon, hides, and mortgage over to them. They both cried, and the old lady kissed me, and the old man hugged me, and I thought I'd plumb die of embarrassment before I could get away. But I did finally, and headed for Panther Springs again, because I still had to raise the dough to get Glaze out of jail. I got there about sun up, and headed straight for Judith's cabin to tell her I'd made friends with Uncle Jabez. Aunt Henrietta was cleaning a carpet on the front porch and looking mad. When I come up, she stared at me and said, Good land, Breckenridge, what happened to you? Oh, nothing, I says. Just a argument with them fool buffalo hunters over at Cordova. They'd cleaned an old gent and his old lady of their buffalo hides, to say nothing of their hosses and wagon. So I rid on to see what I could do about it. Them hairy-necked hunters didn't believe me when I said I wanted them hides, so I had to persuade em a little. Only thing is, they is saying now I was to blame for the whole affair. I apologized to Judas' uncle, too. Had to chase him from here to Cordova. Where's Judith? Gone, she says, stabbing her broom at the floor so vicious she broke the handle off. When she'd taken them pies and cakes to your fool friend down in the jailhouse, she'd taken a shine to him at first sight. So she borrowed the money from me to pay his fine. Said she wanted a new dress to look nice in for you, the deceitful hussy. If I'd knowed what she wanted it for, she wouldn't a got it. She'd a got something across my knee. But she paid him out of the jug, and... And what happened then? I says wildly. She left me a note, snarled Aunt Henrietta, giving the carpet a whack that tore it into six pieces. She said, anyway, she was afeard if she didn't marry him, I'd make her marry you. 
She must have sent you off on that wild goose chase a purpose. Then she met him, and, well, they snuck out and got married, and are now on their way to Denver for their honeymoon. Hey, what's the matter? Are you sick? I be, I gurgled. The ingratitude of mankind cuts me to the gizzard. After all I did for Glaze Bannock. Well, by golly, this is a lesson to me. I bet I don't never work my fingers to the quick getting another ranny out of jail. End of No Cow Herders Wanted